Let's see. Is that open? Oh! Hi! Hello! How are so, you? So, I think I'm here. Yeah. Okay. No, I just decided that on the last second, like, hey, this is not for Skype purposes. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. So, um, I saw some... I mean, I saw what you were doing like a while back because I saw my manifesto. Was oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I once had a class from Geert Loving in which we had to read manifestos. So, oh, yeah. I, I mean, I was taught to really super like manifestos. Yeah. <laughs> but I thought it was really cool back then. Uh -huh. And now that you're making this series, that's even more cool. Yeah, but, I mean, it, it's actually it's surprising just how many well, academics in particular, but also artists, I guess, uh, are writing manifestos, digital man like digital manifestos, manifestos that have to do with digital life, digital art, digital politics, the politics of digital culture, and disseminating them online. So it seemed like a, an interesting project to sort of, you know, put them all in one place and then provide some kind of critical material to accompany. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, no, and I think it might be very interesting to see what kind of people write what kind of manifestos, and if mm -hmm. all the manifestos are the same, but you guys know about that, and I, I haven't done that research. Yeah, well, I mean, I think your manifesto is interesting in, for a number of different reasons. It's a little bit different but in terms of... Wow, I'm very curious about that, because when I looked at it, I yeah. thought, yeah, that's an eight-step manifesto. Yeah. It's like... <laughs> well, it's but different, they... I think, in terms of... Um, Right, I mean, you are, you're both creating art and you also seem to, at certain points, provide concepts, like critical concepts for interpreting what glitch art is. So it's interesting and, and different in that sense. Um, it's also, I think that if, you, if we, I mean, we've interviewed a couple of people now, uh, Jeffrey Schnapp uh, and uh, Yuku, Yukui, and they are, they're very theoretical in terms of like the sort of approach to how they're writing these manifestos and your manifesto is a little bit more practice oriented i think but i mean would you agree yeah. with that so yeah <laughs> like oh yeah that makes sense yeah mm -hmm. so but you know it's sort of interesting like i think as like an avenue into sort of talking about your manifesto in particular you know izzy and i have been discussing your manifesto quite a bit over the weekend um and like uh, well we started out thinking okay we have you know, these questions that we sent you and we, th we think we have an idea of what the response might be. But then as we discussed the questions more and discussed your manifesto more, we started having trouble answering what are seemingly like really fundamental questions, right? Like what is glitch art? Like what is, what is the role of the glitch artist? Um, what is glitch studies? Uh, so maybe like as a, as a first question and as a kind of lead in to talking about your manifesto, um, we're wondering maybe if you can talk about or describe, um, you know, what is the glitch aesthetic? Um, how might it differ from other, you know, forms of, of digital aesthetics? And um, maybe you could even reference some of your own art uh, in this context and what kind of contribution your art makes to this discourse. Yeah. Yeah, that's, I mean, to ask what an aesthetic is, when I was mm -hmm. writing, because I graduated twice uh, for masters. When I did my first masters mm -hmm. in Amsterdam, um, I was actually told never to say anything when it comes to aesthetics <laughs> if not write a PhD about it because if you open that hole, then you're gonna drown, is what she said. Mm -hmm. So I am a little bit hesitant to really say something like more theoretically profound maybe, but from my own perspective I can answer it, like from my own art. Um, so, about glitch aesthetics, generally speaking when we're talking about glitch, we're talking about a word that can be used in different kinds of, um, uh, how would you say it, like not perspectives, but maybe perspectives, let's say it's perspectives. Um, so you can talk about it from a technological point of view, you can talk about it, you know, and technologically it's really just an unexpected break from a flow or a conventional flow of a technological machine. And that's the moment that you that you have no idea what's really happening and what's going to happen after that. So then um, the glitch is really the unknown and it's a momental thing, you know. It's about a point in time that will move on. From an um, artistic point of view, I think it's something very different. You've taken the concept of breaking, uh, which is not a new concept in that sense, because that's what you know, like a hundred years of art is about almost. Uh, and you take that, uh, but then in the digital and make that 
uh, like a metaphor or a subject for a piece of art. So in that sense, it becomes something of a genre, which has a completely other kind of way of describing it. A social point of view, I would say a glitch has become something like um, uh, also a genre, but more like a header of um, people working together in a particular way on the internet, which can be Facebook, also in real life, by the way, I mean, on festivals that are called Glitch. And then it doesn't necessarily have to do anything with breaking something at all. Um, so, and then we go to aesthetics, right? Because right. I just wanted to say, hey, aesthetics is one way of describing it, da -da 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 -da. and then you have aesthetics. So, so um, yeah, then you go and you're working with the language of the technology. So that means different kinds of technologies they use different kinds of languages, protocols, whatnot. Mm -hmm. Those languages follow kind of machinic um, rules, but uh, how would you say that for language that would be like kind of a grammar or vernaculars, they yeah. use kind of uh, spacing to distribute the data, to make it into something another software can use again. So sort of a taxonomy of data. And those taxonomies, they're different per kind of technology that you use. And that could be, for instance, uh, a compression. It could also be a, um, a software on itself. Like, how does it write it away? Um, and the organization of data very often is an, e an economical kind of organization because it has to run faster. And that means that particular blocks of data are organized or distributed um, in a logical, machinic logic way, which means often in blocks, in grids, when it comes to visual output, in lines, you know, and that has a, well, a technological but also a historiological kind of um, yeah, reasoning almost, because some compressions, they come from other kind of machinic histories, so they had to come inside of that technology, so then they use particular parts of that kind of way of writing away. So, talking about yeah. glitch, glitch aesthetics mm -hmm. and the glitch aesthetics that I use, that was the question, right? Right. Um, I would say that's the taxonomy of how the machine writes away its data. So not information, but data. Right. Yeah. Is that... Um, yeah, no, it makes blah, a lot of... Blah, blah, blah. Right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, in that sense, right, it, it really... Um, I think this really is conveyed in your manifesto, but it is an incredibly adaptable, um, situational sort of approach to producing some kind of art object. I mean, maybe if I can frame it that way. Um, is that something you would agree with? Is that there has to be a sort of context-based, situational approach. Um, if you're dealing with different languages, different logics, right? And then especially if, with, if the moment of the glitch, right, where you don't know what's going to happen and what will happen after, is that it's really kind of situational and uh, momentary context from which to produce art. Yeah, I mean, I guess nobody makes also art out of a void. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to make technologically inspired work, right, then that's the situation you're in. <laughs> right, I mean, right. Yeah, that's just one-on-one, -on -one, I would say. Okay. Yeah, does that... I mean, that's a boring answer, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's like I think it's uh, like the right. I mean, like it seems like a very clear answer to me. But yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So I guess I'll move on to um, a question about your manifesto. Um, so you open your manifesto by emphasizing the positive consequence of imperfection. Um, so what does this mean aesthetically, and what does it mean critically, methodologically for glitch study? I guess. Okay, yeah. So, um, well, basically, to me, this part is also just to make sure that people realize that there's a whole lot of talk in um, negatives and positives. So, uh, how would you say, like, dichotomies in mm -hmm. how people reason about glitches? And to just make sure I'm always on both of the legs. I'm always both negative and positive about it. So people are very much used to looking at their media in terms of resolutions. And in, with a resolution, I mean, like, for instance, 
And this is a, a story that I keep telling people. So it might be boring, maybe, but at the same time, like I think it comes to the core. And I might be writing a new manifesto that's not about glitch, but and yeah. won't use the word glitch at all. But it will use the word resolutions. Oh, okay. Anyway, so the word resolution means to me um, not just you know you go at war and you want to win some turf, <laughs> and um, once you win you make a resolution and nobody can step on your turf anymore, you know, like that's the resolution. Um, it's also a way of looking at s things at some point. So uh, a screen resolution is um, to make the stream of information come at a certain quality, definition, but also uh, at a certain speed. So a resolution is a mode of operating. Um, that has multiple, um, I say like, not people, but um, operators, mm. <laughs> like the pixels, like the speed, like the, yeah. you know, those all those operators were fighting to get as much, you know, power over the turf. <laughs> and then uh, these people win this amount of pixels and this amount of colors and this amount of blah, blah, blah. Okay, so the resolution becomes 1280 by 720 with a million colors. Great. <laughs> um, however, that's a very boring resolution because it still has four corners. All resolutions still have four corners because we've been learned to look only via those rules and they turn um, away other ways of forming resolutions. So somehow we've become blind to other resolutions that could have been. So, for instance, a screen with five corners, or six corners, or nine corners is out of that whole conversation. So a resolution has also become a mode of looking at stuff and becoming blind to other ways of looking, you know? Mm -hmm. And so um, the positive part of looking at glitches can also be suddenly seeing resolutions that were totally not on the table. They were just not going to happen ever. And that's when we became blind for them, but then the glitch can bring back that kind of conversation about, for instance, an inst for instance, an aesthetic output, you know, like, for instance, hey, wait a minute, we can have actually nine corners or a million corners to our videos. That would be great. I could make something completely different from video. I could make a video installation with different kinds of, you know, <laughs> forms of video on top of each other and video would become something else. So I think, um, yeah, in terms of what is positive uh, about that aesthetic output, to answer that, um, is that suddenly we get to see possibilities that were never on the table, maybe. And I think that is kind of, it's good to realize that there are certain dogmas in looking at our media that have made us blind to perceiving media in another, completely other way. Media. I think that is a, that's a good... Um, perhaps it's a good transition. There's another uh, sort of concept you develop in the manifesto, which is uh, the concept of glitch speak. Um, and given like, I, I think it's actually really provocative in, the, in that positive turn to sort of emphasize the sort of perhaps potentially infinite possibilities, right, that might occur otherwise as a result of a glitch. Here, you define glitch speak, or one of the definitions of glitch speak is a sort of always growing vocabulary of expressions. So I'm wondering what the, you know, what the content, right? Um, maybe you could uh, tell us a little bit more about what glitch speak is. And I have a couple questions to follow up on that, maybe about the, the politics of glitch speak and the sort of context in which it might be created or appears. So, but maybe if you could um, give us more of a, a definition of what, what you mean by glitch speak. Well, I used glitch speak as an opposition to new speak, right? Mm, right. <laughs> That's a reference to George Orwell yeah, in 1984. Mm. And it's, um, yeah, it's a fictional language he describes. And it's a book from 1949, I believe. I don't know for sure. Mm. Um, but anyway, it's very futurist. It's almost, yeah. well, and may, or maybe not at all. Maybe it was already happening back then because you had the, the ISO, right? the International Organization of Standardization, they came up in 1920-something, I think, or 1930s. So they were standardizing protocols, languages, and everything before he wrote 19 1984. Um, 
and ISO is actually what we're talking about when we're talking about four cornered screens. Yeah. I mean, that's totally ISO. Mm -hmm. Like that's ISO's doing. That's the language of ISO <laughs> right in your face. Yeah. So um, he's talking about Newspeak as a language that uh, was um, by the the high power people. They all wanted, um, well, you know, the power. Uh, what's it called? Big Brother. It was not the party. The yeah, party, the party Big Brother, yeah. wanted people to speak Newspeak, and mm -hmm. that was the language of fewer words basically it was a shrinking language mm -hmm. so everybody would always know um you know what people meant you couldn't self-express there was no real freedom or individuality because there was only this kinds of words that you could use mm -hmm. and then it was just totally clear well that's kind of what the computer does right now right and that's mm -hmm. what the apple macintosh computer <laughs> what they had that beautiful commercial against yes 1984 won't be like 1984 well that's what we're actually have been brought mm -hmm. somehow which is great i mean that's fantastic <laughs> i'm gonna start the, um, the institution against 1984 um <laughs> to show that 1984 has become 1984 but that's a <laughs> Right. That's the institution for resolutional disputes, but that's a, but anyway, that's the um, the institution that will bring you Glitchpeak. Well, um, anyway, so what's Glitchpeak? Well, Glitchpeak yeah. is not Newspeak, so it's opposite to that, and it's opposite to um, what Apple said it would not bring us, but what Apple has brought us. You know, like it's it's um, it's the girl with the blonde hair and the red short. Um, that brings the big hammer to destroy the screen. That's uh, glitch peak. Mm -hmm. No, it's a good. It's sort of like a answer through metaphors, right through a string, because it's like it's opposed to seamless usable media. Um, so then I'm, in, I guess I'm interested in two things, right? If glitch speak is the sort of language that disrupts seamless usable media, there's a political element to it there's a clearly a kind of aesthetics to it so i'm interested in um first you make in your manifesto about how glitch speak has perhaps the potential to democratize um society right so i'm interested in that as a sort of political claim but i'm also interested in that as a practice so how would uh glitch speak produce that kind of democratizing response to uh these very formalized and seamless media objects. So, but uh, Glitch Peak um, doesn't disrupt. It can disrupt. It yeah. doesn't need to disrupt, right? That's mm -hmm. point one to your. I mean, I believe that Glitch Peak is also a language of conventions in the end, or can turn into, like, have its own vernacular, its own speak, and its own terms. Once you get those terms, those metaphors that always work. You get used to it and you become just, I mean, the ideal would be that we can always surf the waves, yeah. you know, and be on top of this vortex or inside of this vortex. Um, but that is a fight that everybody will lose and then we'll have to bounce back into. So it goes always like you're on the wave as a science wave. Mm -hmm. um, does it have power for dem democratizing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does. But mm -hmm. Well, yeah, the, the, um, it seems like what you're describing is actually um, maybe democracy is not the best word for it because sort of in this in riding this wave, right, there seems to be kind of like a, a anarchic or the potential for a kind of anarchic principle, right? That which sort of disrupts the sort of an institution or um, a, a, for a particular vernacular or a particular grammar, right? And then there's this sort of, uh, again, this sort of... Um, project to sort of reinstitutionalize or to make glitch speak an institution right so there's a there's a dueling there's a sort of a dueling po politics here where you know there's the there's the potential to disrupt and politics that's what you're talking about yeah right yeah because there's the the, the the potential to disrupt and there's the potential to institutionalize if we can use that language right and glitch speak sort of find Oh, sorry, sorry. oh, it finds itself right in the middle. That's all I have to say. As glitch speaks yeah. seems to be right in the middle of that tension. Well, it also can become totalitarian mm -hmm. versus democracy, and it has a little bit of both. I mean, you can say if you're still talking into um, 
Orwellian terms. It can be both glasnost and the party at the same mm-hmm. time. And that's great and scary. Mm-hmm. Um, but I do like that power. <laughs> I do like that you can use it for both. And I think as long as you... I mean... That's a... I mean, as an artist... I mean, we can talk all about reality and stuff. Um, in reality, um, it's a little bit more difficult. But for um, developing new technological resolutions, and also, and those come very often out of art projects, right? So, in that sense, um, from that, I think from that perspective, we can still make a difference with the power of a glitch peak or the power of a resolutional dispute. Yeah. And um, that dispute is between knowing what the totalitarian language of many, many uh, protocols involve. I don't know if that was, there was so many difficult words following (laughs) each other up. No, but it makes it. First language, yeah. Uh, Versus um, disrupting that. I mean, there's a lot of power in there. I'm not always. I also do like to follow the rules. Actually, I'm not necessarily a punk at all. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I love to just sit back and see what it all brings. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 